Good morning, class. <clears throat> this week and next week, we're going to cover chapter six. Um, so this week, we're going to go into just the first half. And it's not really the first half. Um, the pages in the textbook that this first lecture is going to cover in lecture 6a is or are pages 133 uh, to 140. This can be a pretty complicated topic, so I wanted to uh, break it in half to not overwhelm you with this. Um, all at one time because um, bioenergetics, as we call this, um, can be kind of complicated, especially if you're, you've never covered the subject before, which I'm guessing a lot of you have it um, as you're sort of early in your college career. Okay, so the title of this chapter is Energy Transfer in the Body. So just to recall what we talked about in the last chapter, um, that First law of thermodynamics states that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It is transformed from one form to the other or to another. Um, as we identified, the sun is the ultimate source of energy on the planet Earth. Okay, Plants can convert the solar energy or the light energy into carbohydrate energy, Okay, which we can then consume or an animal can eat the carbohydrate energy from the plant and convert it into fat or protein energy. And we call those things carbohydrate, fat, and protein. We call those the, the macronutrients, right? Now, when we consume food, we consume the macronutrients. We cannot directly use the energy from macronutrients as fuel. However, we have to convert the macronutrient energy into another form of energy um, which is biologically usable to us as humans. And that form of energy, as we'll talk about um, a lot today, is known as ATP. That stands for adenosine triphosphate, okay? So this is a molecule that contains uh, three phosphates, okay? That's where the triphosphate comes from. And then there is a molecule of adenosine that really links those three phosphates together, okay? And energy is harnessed in the bonds that hold those phosphates together, okay? So when we're producing ATP, we are storing energy in those phosphate bonds, okay? Then when we use ATP, the energy held in those phosphate bonds is liberated and able to be used as the bonds are broken apart, okay? So again, ATP is the biologically usable form of energy, okay? Um, as we'll see, the potential energy that is stored in ATP that bonds those phosphates together is required for all processes that occur in the human body that require energy, and there are a lot of them, okay? <clears throat> so in cells, you know, as we'll see, we will create energy. We will create potential energy. We will convert the energy found in those macronutrients into ATP. And that's really what the purpose of bioenergetics is. Bioenergetics is the, the word that we use to describe how energy is converted to a biologically usable form. And that form is of course uh, ATP, okay? And then as I mentioned, we will use the energy that is housed, that is stored in ATP to perform a whole host of types of uh, biological work, okay? <clears throat> so here is, uh, there actually here are two equations that are used to symbolize the process through which ATP can either be created or liberated. Um, the energy from ATP can be liberated. I like this one at the bottom. It's much simpler, okay? And what this one shows us is when ATP, is has an interaction with its enzyme, which is called ATPase. Remember last lecture, we talked about enzymes are proteins that interact with substrates. Enzymes always, the name of an enzyme always ends in ASE. So the enzyme that is responsible for promoting the reaction of splitting ATP apart is called ATPase. Uh, so when ATP interacts with ATPase, this molecule is split into these three things that we see here. So ADP, adenosine diphosphate, which means two phosphates. One molecule of PI or inorganic phosphate, and then there is energy, okay? So just to review, 
in the ATP molecule, we have three phosphates bound together and there's energy stored in those bonds. When we break it apart after it interacts with ATPase, the energy is liberated as the bonds are broken apart. And essentially, one of the phosphates now becomes inorganic, okay? Uh, so as we'll see later, we can use these byproducts to reform ATP, okay? AT the ATP process is very much reversible, okay? When we need energy, ATP is broken apart. When we are recovering from exercise, for example, we make more ATP and the reaction goes this direction, okay? Sorry about that. Now, another equation that is given by the textbook that is very similar, it's just a little bit more complicated. Um, they show that water is present in the reaction, so when ATP and water interact with the enzyme, ATPase, Again, we have um, an ADP, a phosphate, which they do not call inorganic, okay? But then they show you how much energy is created. So 7.3 kilocalories per mole of energy is what is liberated from one single ATP molecule. I don't want you all to be concerned about the, uh, the specificity of this number or this equation today. Instead, I want you to focus on this uh, very simple equation, okay? So when you're answering questions for the lecture study questions and even for the critical thinking assignment, focus on using this uh, simpler equation here, okay? <clears throat> so again, as this molecule is busted apart, energy is liberated, okay? And that energy that is liberated can be used to fuel whatever biological process we're talking about. Since this is exercise physiology, of course, our brain should go to muscle contraction, okay? So when we get into how skeletal muscles function, there are these little proteins called um, myosin proteins, okay, that cause muscles to shorten and lengthen. On those myosin proteins, there is a lot of ATPs present, ATPase present. So when an ATP molecule is sort of loaded onto the myosin protein, ATPase is already there, the ATP molecule is split apart, liberating the energy that energizes that myosin head and that calls the muscle to shorten, okay? Another ATP is also required to allow, allow it to lengthen. And that process of shortening, lengthening, shortening, lengthening is literally how a muscle can move, okay? So ATP is required for shortening and lengthening of skeletal muscles, among other things, as this slide shows, right? So pretty much any process in the body that will require energy, such as digestion, the aforementioned muscle action, uh, the contraction and relaxation of the heart, which of course the heart is a muscle, so these two are, are sort of related to one another. Muscle contraction is influenced by ATP, but also nervous system activity is requires ATP, okay? And then the secretion of hormones from glands, right? So pretty much any single thing in our body that um, produces movement of any type is going to require ATP. And this picture here in the middle shows us sort of the, the chemical nature of the molecule. So notice I said there were three phosphates, right? And that is shown here. So one, two, three. There's the triphosphate. And then over on this side is the adenosine molecule, which is composed of ribose and adenine, which are basically carbon, nitrogen, and um, hydrogen combined together. So when the molecule is broken apart as energy is liberated, these three phosphates are broken apart, leaving us with adenosine diphosphate, ADP, plus one inorganic phosphate, which is a single phosphate. So where does this occur? Okay, where does ATP production occur? There are mainly, you know, it's going to occur in a cell, to, to put it simply, okay? Um, but there are two locations within a cell where it can occur, okay? And that kind of brings us to the discussion about energy systems, all right? We have two broad classifications of energy systems. We have the aerobic energy system 
and the anaerobic energy system. Okay, the aerobic energy system requires oxygen. All aerobic energy production is going to occur inside the cell, inside a specific organelle of the cell called the mitochondria or the mitochondrion. Mitochondrion is a single organelle. Mitochondria refers to a bunch of them. Okay, and what they look like are these little jelly bean-like structures here in the cell. This shows sort of a, a bisection of one. If it was split in half, what it would look like, right? And this shows what it would look like if it was closed off as one unit, okay? So that's where aerobic energy production occurs inside the mitochondria. Anaerobic energy production also occurs inside of a cell, but this occurs in uh, what we call the cytosol or the um, cytoplasm, sarcoplasm, they all sort of mean the same thing, but it's like the fluid component of the cell. So the enzymes that control anaerobic energy production, specifically glycolysis, which is something we're going to learn about next week, that occurs directly in the cytosol. Okay. Aerobic energy production is much more efficient. It produces a lot more ATP, but it takes a little bit longer to do its job where anaerobic energy production is very inefficient. We don't get as much ATP out of it, but it occurs and provides ATP much more rapidly because it exists here in the cytosol, right? So if a cell needs energy very rapidly, glycolysis is used. If a cell needs energy more slowly, but a lot of it, aerobic energy production is used. And realistically, I'm going to say this a lot in class. Um, it's not like an either or thing or on or off. It's more of a dimmer switch at all times in life. We are never using just one of these, right? Usually it's a blend of the two, depending upon the activity, we might be using more aerobic or more anaerobic, but there's always going to be a contribution of both going on at all times. Okay. So that's something I just want to clear up and we'll talk about that a little bit more later and we're going to get in next week really we're going to get into what these two processes uh, really look like how they operate etc that's where it's going to get more complicated next week once we get into glycolysis and the aerobic energy systems okay but let's jump back and, and talk about ATP okay now the reason we need energy systems is because a, we have to produce ATP, which we already talked about, but B, we only store a very limited amount of ATP, okay? So when our ATP that we have stored is used up, we need to produce more right away, okay? Now, how fast does our stored ATP get used up? Well, if you look at this bullet point here, you'll see that it gets used up very fast. We only store enough ATP in our body to power only two to three seconds of maximal exercise. Okay, so that's not very long, right? What that looks like is about 80 to 100 grams. So in our entire body, we only store about 80 to 100 grams of ATP. The variance would depend upon the person's body size, right? The larger somebody is, the more ATP their cells are gonna store simply because they have more cells. Uh, the smaller somebody is, the lower the number would be. Uh, but nonetheless, either, either way, you're talking about a very small amount, okay? There's a couple advantages to that. First of all, uh, ATP has weight. The more we stored, the more pounds we would have to carry around. That's disadvantageous for survival. Secondly, having such a small amount stored means that any change in ATP storage um, will promote our energy systems to start ramping up their activity, right? In fact, we talked about how different things can control enzyme function. Um, there are, are th certain things that stimulate enzyme activity to increase. One of those things I did not mention last week is declining ATP levels. So when ATP levels start to drop, which they do in as little as two to three seconds of activity, enzyme function, enzymes in the aerobic and the anaerobic energy systems 
are stimulated to start doing their thing, which means creating more ATP. Okay. Uh, so the implications of this really, what, I, what I'm getting at is um, no matter what we're doing, any type of activity, we're going to need our energy systems to start getting fired up right away and start producing ATP. So no matter what we're doing, we cannot ever really rely on stored ATP. So even me getting up out of bed and walking to the bathroom, that's going to require my energy systems to start producing more ATP to fuel that little amount of movement, right? So then kind of contrast that to doing a 400 meter sprint around the track, right? We're going to need a lot of ATP because in two to three seconds of me per performing that 400 meter sprint, all the ATP I had stored in my cells is going to be gone. So I need my energy systems to get ready to give me to uh, produce more ATP that I can use to then continue that maximal muscle contraction. In, in, in the first bullet point, uh, I kind of skipped, but this brings me to it now is that as I mentioned, no matter what I'm doing, getting out of bed or running, ATP is being used up. So I need to continually replenish it. Okay. These energy systems that we're going to talk about, they exist to allow ATP to be immediately replenished. Okay. So in fact, ATP levels really don't ever decrease um, because as soon as they start to fall as they would in two to three seconds, they're immediately replenished by our energy systems. Okay. So imagine that's kind of like a, a bathtub, right? Let's say that I have a bathtub and the drain is closed and there's water in the bathtub. Uh, me starting to exercise is like me opening the drain of the bathtub. That water is going to start to drain out, but I'm going to then turn the water on right away. Okay. So as fast as that water drains, more water is entering, so the level in the bathtub never goes down. So even though I'm using the water in the tub or the water in the tub is draining out, I'm putting more water in the tub at the same time. That's kind of like what happens with our um, ATP stores. We're using it, but we're making more at the same time, so the level stays the same. Okay? Um, all right. Now, this process, as we talked about, involves us using... The macronutrients, okay, along with, in the case of aerobic energy production, oxygen to produce more ATP. Now, as ATP is utilized or catabolized, okay, remember we said that as the molecule is broken apart, three things are left. Energy is liberated, which is used, okay, and then we're left with these, what we call the byproducts, okay, ADP and PI. Now, those things, they don't just get excreted, right? They get recycled, okay? And what happens is the energy that is liberated from the macronutrients, carbohydrate, fat, and protein, is used to reform the bonds and energize this inorganic phosphate, yielding us another molecule of ATP, okay? So I want you to think of this as recycling. That's very much how we could describe what is going on with energy liberation. As ATP is split apart, the energy is used for movement, creation of anything. Endergonic, remember, means we're liberating energy. Okay, We're left with these byproducts, but then these byproducts are recycled. Energy is added to them by the energy systems and more ATP is made. So this is very much just like a cycle. Energy is liberated, energy is stored. Energy is liberated, energy is stored. Energy is liberated, energy is stored. It just goes round and round and round, okay? Until ultimately if I just stopped and sat down and fell asleep, I would just keep making ATP to replenish everything that I used up but I wouldn't continue to use it at a high rate as I would when I was exercising. So the cycle, I guess we could say um, the rate changes based upon what we're doing. When I'm exercising, I'm running, this is occurring very rapidly. Round and round and round. Excuse me. But when I'm resting, 
this process is still occurring, but the rate is much slower. And it might even grind to a, a halt when I'm asleep. Okay? But even when I'm asleep, am I using energy? What do you all think? Yes or no? Yes, right? Our heart is still beating when we're asleep. Should. That requires energy. Um, we're still having nervous system activity while we're asleep. Um, digestion is still occurring while we're asleep. So this process of the utilization and replenishment of ATP is ongoing at all times. The question is, how fast is it occurring? What is the volume at which it occurs? That is controlled by our activity. When we're sleeping, it's very low. When we're exercising at a maximal rate, it's very high. Okay, so the activity determines the rate and the, the overall volume of ATP cycling. Okay, so where does the ATP come from? Now, I briefly mentioned aerobic and anaerobic, right? So aerobic I have listed as point number three. Anaerobic actually has two different sort of sub energy systems, okay? And those can be divided into the phosphocreatine system, which you'll see abbreviated as the PCR system, or glycolysis, which I mentioned earlier, okay? Now, <clears throat> we're not gonna get into this today, but notice that glycolysis can be divided into either anaerobic glycolysis or aerobic glycolysis. What that means is glycolysis can occur or it can function either with or without oxygen, okay? And then lastly, or the aerobic energy system, which has the more formal name of oxidative phosphorylation, absolutely requires oxygen, okay? As we'll see, OP, as I like to call it, oxidative phosphorylation, has two phases. Uh, the Krebs cycle is phase one, and then the electron transport chain is phase two. We're going to briefly look at those today, but we're going to really more focus on them next week. Okay, but let's jump back to the top and, and notice how I have these time durations associated with each. So if we jump back one second, we said that stored ATP gives us about two to three seconds of energy production. At that point, then the phosphocreatine system takes over and from 3 to 15 seconds, the majority of our ATP production, which is again used to fuel activity, comes from the phosphocreatine system. Okay. As we continue to exercise, from 30 to to 120 seconds or from 30 seconds to two minutes, glycolysis takes over and is the primary supplier of ATP production. Beyond two minutes, anything, be any activity that lasts greater than two minutes, at that two minute mark and beyond, oxidative phosphorylation takes over as the primary supplier of ATP production, okay? Now in the critical thinking assignment, uh, what I ask you to do is to think about these time durations. 3 to 15 seconds, 30 to 120 seconds, greater than two minutes. And I want you to think of physical activities or sports, exercises, events, whatever you want to pick, um, that would primarily be fueled by each of these energy systems. So I'm going to give you a hint, and I'd like for you not to use these as your example, but think of something different. Um, but let's think of something that would take us anywhere from three to 15 seconds to, to complete. So I'll use a, a very general example. That's not really a, a specific activity, but you could think of something that's kind of similar to this. Let's say if I'm, if I'm on a basketball court and I'm on one baseline and I'm gonna sprint to the opposite baseline, that's gonna probably take me maybe four seconds. Just, I'm just kind of guessing. Because that activity only takes four seconds, that means that that activity is primarily going to be fueled by my phosphocreatine system. Okay. Now let's jump to the glycolysis. Uh, let's think of an activity that would take us this somewhere in this range. Um, if we did a 400 meter run around a track 
that could take us, you know, depending upon how fast you are. Some of you are probably pretty fast at this. Some of you, maybe not so much, maybe anywhere from like 45 to 75 seconds. Okay. Either way, that's right in the heart of this time duration, which means running a 400 meter race or just a lap is primarily going to be fueled by glycolysis. Okay. Now down here, what about this? Well, if you run a 5K, a 5K might take you anywhere from, which says 3.1 miles, 16 minutes if you're pretty fast, maybe even 15 if you're like an Olympic level fast, to 25 to 30 minutes, right? Depending upon your level as a runner. Either way, though, it's more than two minutes. So a 5K is primarily going to be fueled by the aerobic energy system okay so i want you to think about that um and i will say like i said earlier this is not an on or off switch this is not a one or the other all three are contributing to any activity notice the key word i said was primarily events lasting longer than two minutes are primarily fueled by op events lasting between 30 to 120 seconds are primarily fueled by glycolysis and events lasting 3 to 15 seconds are primarily fueled by phosphocreatine system, not only, but primarily. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the phosphocreatine system to finish up here today. Um, you might see this um, called a few different names. When I was in school, what we called it was the immediate energy system. So sometimes I'll refer to it as that because that's just kind of uh, the way I learned it. Okay, but I like that name because it kind of tells you that when you need energy fast, right away, for a short duration activity, such as, a, I don't know, a broad jump, okay? This is the system I'm primarily gonna use. Uh, if I'm doing strength training, and I'm doing a set of maybe eight reps, the primary system I'm gonna use to do that activity is the immediate energy system or the phosphate creatine system, okay? One way to look at this system is as an energy reservoir, okay? Um, there is a tremendous amount of energy stored in this molecule that we call phosphocreatine, okay? And our cells actually store a lot more phosphocreatine than they do ATP. In fact, as it so shows here in red, our cells will store about four to six times more phosphocreatine than they do ATP, okay? So when the ATP runs low, which we already said it would do in three seconds, Phosphocreatine is there to allow us to replenish the ATP that we've already used, okay? Um, 10 seconds is where it peaks, um, but as I said earlier, 3 to 15 seconds is where it contributes. Uh, but at 10 seconds, we're looking at like almost 100% of the ATP we're using comes from the phosphocreatine system, okay? So again, what activities would this primarily power? I've thrown out a couple. I just threw out another one, you know, strength training. Any activity that's going to last in this 3 to 15 second range, this system is going to primarily power. Okay, so how does it work? Uh, well, here we see um, a couple equations uh, in this figure, and I'll show you on the next slide some, some simpler equations. Uh, but notice here we have our ATP equation, right? ATP, when it interacts with ATPase, the molecule is split into three things. ADP, inorganic phosphate, and energy, right? And that energy is used for whatever work that we're doing. Now where PCR comes in is down here, right? The ADP that is liberated from the splitting of the ATP molecule can combine with phosphocreatine, okay? When these two things combine and the enzyme phospho, or sorry, creatine phosphokinase, or what we call CK. The molecules are essentially rearranged, okay? The, the phosphate is stripped off the phosphocreatine and added to the ADP, giving us a molecule of ATP and leaving us with a molecule of creatine, right? So we have, here we're looking at three phosphates in one creatine, and we're looking at the same thing here. What we've done is we've rearranged these molecules into these, right? Giving us another molecule of ATP, which can just kind of go up here and be utilized for energy again, 
Okay, so again, it's recycling. We're taking the ADP that we liberated here and we're recycling it to form another molecule of ATP. So this is a system that very much goes round and round. It does not stop until our creatine phosphate stores are depleted, which they would be in about 15 seconds of all out exercise. Okay, so if you're sprinting as hard as you can, you can run all out for about 15 seconds. But once your creatine phosphate stores run out, then your intensity is going to drop slightly, right? So again, it's recycling here. So I'll show you on this slide sort of my take on the equations. Again, notice the enzymes. ATPase is required to split ATP. Creatine kinase or phosphocreatine kinase is required to join PCR and ADP together. When those three things interact, we get another molecule of ATP, which we can then use to continue the activity, leaving us with the byproduct of creatine. Now in the recovery from exercise, our aerobic energy system stays active. We'll talk about that next week, producing a lot of ATP, okay? What that ATP is used for in the recovery phase from exercise is to first replenish all of our ATP stores, but some of that ATP is also used to replenish our PCR stores. Now, I don't show you on this on these equations, but here you'll notice that they have arrows going both ways, okay? And what this means is these reactions are reversible. They can go in both directions. Now, during exercise, the reactions are gonna go left to right, both of them, left to right. During recovery, these reactions will go right to left because we want to replenish our PCR stores that were depleted during exercise. We also want to replenish our ATP stores that were depleted during exercise, right? So during, during activity, these reactions go left to right. During recovery, these reactions go right to left because they are reversible. The enzyme is required both directions. All right, so again, when I'm, when I'm asking you to write the equations and the questions, you can just use these, uh, what I call the simple equations that are here. Okay, so beyond that 15 seconds, we're running for a longer period of time, we're swimming for a longer period of time. We're going to need to continue to produce energy, and that's where our more complex energy systems come into play. So this one is very simple. The next two, glycolysis, aerobic energy production, are more complex. Okay. So what I want to do quickly is just sort of introduce these two systems to you, and then next week we'll dive into them and look at what is exactly going on. Okay. <clears throat> now in both cases, we're going to take, we haven't even talked about the macronutrients, right? Remember that phosphocreatine system does not require carbohydrate, fat, or protein. The other energy systems that we're going to talk about now, they do, okay? In the energy from those macronutrients, carbohydrate, fat, and protein, is found in the electrons that hold those molecules together, okay? So we talked about this a little bit in the last lecture that redox reactions or oxidation and reduction reactions they involve uh, removing electrons from one molecule, which in this example would be the carbohydrate or the fat, okay? And then adding them to another molecule, which would essentially be ATP, okay? So the energy that is stored in these electrons that hold carbohydrate and fat together are transferred from the carbohydrate and fat molecules to our ADP and PI molecules and used to rejoin them together, okay? Back here, we kind of saw that energy is liberated. Well, the energy from the electrons that we strip out in glycolysis in OP can be used to drive the reaction this direction, making us more ATP, which we can then use for activity okay 
So this is really the key sort of purpose of bioenergetics is to take the energy that is stored in the electrons that hold these molecules together, stripping those electrons out, transferring them to the um, adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate molecules to make ATP. Um, and again, I'm just previewing this now, so I'm just kind of touching on the surface. We'll get into this more um, next class, but you know, this is just showing you a diagram that essentially two things are required. Um, one thing is required, one thing is produced. As we get into this electron transport, they call it, you'll notice that electrons are going to be harvested, stripped off, okay? And a lot of ATP is going to be produced as these electrons are harvested, okay? And then we are left with kind of like this waste product where we have these hydrogens, okay? And these extra electrons, okay, that are left that we have to do something with. And then that's where oxygen comes into play. Oxygen, I said, was required for aerobic energy production, which sounds like it has a really important role, but really oxygen is almost like the garbage man, okay? Oxygen purely is there to act as what we see here, the final electron acceptor. Oxygen combines with these extra and leftover hydrogens and electrons to form water. Okay, which is good for us. Okay, so through all this energy production that we're going to talk about, sort of um, oxygen's ultimate role at the end of it is to act as the final acceptor of these electrons and make water. Okay, so is, is that really a waste product? No, because water is used in our body for a lot of life giving functions. <clears throat> So again, I don't really want to talk about this now, um, other than just to kind of point out, <clears throat> as we'll see next week, more ATP is produced aerobically than anaerobically. So the aerobic energy system takes longer to get fired up, but once it gets going, it produces just a ton of ATP. Okay, so we'll see that next class, next lecture. <clears throat> And this is kind of showing us, again, what I've been talking about, that as we go through the processes of electron transport, <clears throat> lots and lots of electrons are harvested, all of them producing ATP. And again, we'll see what the, the energy yield of that is when we get into the specifics of it next class. <clears throat> now, it isn't efficient, um, as I indicated to you all last week. Um, a lot of energy that we produce sort of gets wasted is heat, okay? The efficiency of the aerobic energy system is only 34%, which means only 34% of that energy that we produce actually goes towards the production of work. The other 66% gets released as heat, okay? And that kind of explains why our body gets so warm when we exercise, because as we're producing energy, we're producing a lot of heat as well. And that's why our body temperature elevates during the exercise. However, we saw that that can be advantageous, right? Because heat, as our body temperature rises, our enzymes are stimulated to work faster, which gives us more ATP, okay? As we said earlier, Aerobic energy production occurs inside of the mitochondria. This gives us a little closer look at what the inside of a mitochondria looks like. Um, so we have our inner, we have our, sorry, our matrix here in our, our inner membrane. As the hydrogen molecules pass through the inner membrane, that's where the electrons are stripped off and that's where how the energy production um, actually occurs. <clears throat> I'm starting to lose my voice, which is a signal I should probably stop talking. Um, and as I pointed out earlier, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. So what we're going to do is stop here, okay, for today. Um, this is going to end week three. So I have a set of study questions and a critical thinking assignment based on just that part of the lecture we did, and it's based upon these pages of the textbook. Uh, for next week, for week four, we're going to pick it up on this next slide, okay, at this point in time, I have not edited 
the rest of this PowerPoint yet. Okay, so I will edit that part of the PowerPoint and then I'll record another recording obviously next week that'll be over the edited part of the slides. Uh, the pages that we're gonna go over next week are listed here, 141 to 156. What we're gonna really do is dive into glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. So this is probably gonna be one of the hardest um, weeks that we're going to do this semester so just prepare yourselves for it um, if you have any questions about what we talked about in this past lecture that i just did please email me and ask me post on the discussion boards etc um, the key thing i wanted you to get out of this week is what atp is what it does what the equation looks like and then a good understanding of the phosphocreatine system and that it is the first step in the energy production process. And then after that, we go glycolysis, oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, so that's it for today, everyone. Um, you know, let me know if you have any questions and I'll come back and talk to you next week with the remainder of chapter six, chapter six B. Have a great week. Bye-bye.